the land of Kem. I am your host and the author, Jeff to the land of Kem. I am your host and the author, Jeffrey Drum. Thank you so much for joining me for part two of this ongoing video series here on my YouTube channel. I really appreciate everyone's support and let's get right into it. Of course, the <laughs> obligatory website and social media plug, the book, The Land of Chem, an initiation into ancient chemistry through the degrees of the Egyptian pyramids is now available for digital download on my website, which is www.thelandofchem.com. I also have some pretty badass t-shirts available uh, on the website, www.thelandofchem.com. The design on the t-shirt is a 45, 45, 90 degree triangle which represents the Red Pyramid. And there are ammonia molecules inside the Red Pyramid. Of course, the big question being, what is ammonia doing inside of the Red Pyramid? Well, you can download your copy of the book to find out, again, at www.thelandofchem.com. I also have some paperback copies of the book coming out later this year. I am extremely excited about the design process thus far. Uh, if the <laughs> narrative and the theories contained within it were not unique enough, just wait until you see the physical copies of this book. It's gonna look absolutely amazing. I will be making a formal announcement about the book release on my social media page, which is on Instagram, at the land of Kim. So please follow me on Instagram if you're interested in keeping up with my regular posts at the land of chem. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the land of chem YouTube channel. If you like this video, leave a like, please feel free to leave a comment below. I'm genuinely interested in hearing everyone's feedback. I love the comments and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what everyone thinks about these videos and about the book. Okay, so a little background on the name of the book, The Land of Chem, spelled C-H-E-M, which is just a play on words for the original name of Egypt, which was K-H-E-M, Chem. And the word Chem meant blackness, which referred to the rich, dark alluvial soil surrounding the Nile River, which was produced by the annual Nile River flooding. And we know that this flooding was essential to the Egyptian civilization. From this dark, rich alluvial soil, they were able to produce all of the crops that sustained this civilization. So again, Egypt gradually became to be known as the land of Chem. However, there is a secondary interpretation to the word Chem, which applies to the alchemical or chemical reaction process. And there is a stage of the alchemical process known as the negredo. And the negredo can refer to either the calcination or putrefaction stages of the alchemical process. Of course, putrefaction being the decomposition or rotting of the raw materials which produce a black sludge or the calcination stage during which your raw materials were burnt down to ashes and from these black ashes, you can extract using chemical solvents the volatile compounds from those raw materials. So again, the word chem, meaning blackness, has its origins in the Nile River flooding and also in chemistry. And we know that Egypt was the birthplace of the science of chemistry. They were masters of chemistry. So again, the land of chem referred to the land of the Nile and also the land of chemistry. And our modern word chemistry traces its roots to alchemy. And again, alchemy means from the blackness, referring to this chemical extraction process from your blackened raw materials. Uh, so again, the land of chem spelled C-H-E-M. It's just the land of chemistry, which was the true purpose of the Egyptian pyramids. So in the last video, um, I discussed some of the sites that really started to change my mind in regard to the true purpose of the Egyptian pyramids. 
So I traveled to Egypt intent on investigating some of the alternative theories in regard to the Great Pyramid. However, when we arrived, I quickly began to learn that those theories were not applicable and there was a completely different story to be told. So what you see here is um, this granite collection bowl at the pyramids of Abu Sir. And this granite conduit led from the pyramid underneath the black basalt floor of the adjacent temple and the conduit led out into this granite collection bowl or granite receptacle. So again, when I saw this, I said, okay, they were producing something and collecting something. And the theory contained within the fictional narrative of the land of Kem is that the Egyptian pyramids were producing chemicals on an industrial scale. So if the Egyptians were masters of chemistry and they had knowledge of this science, it made a lot of sense to me that they would also be producing these structures on a large scale. Again, chemistry being essential to any great civilization, the same way to the ancient Egyptians as it is to us uh, in our modern day society. We could not survive without chemistry. And I believe the same to be true for the ancient Egyptians. So again, um, one of the theories in the book is that the temples adjacent to the pyramids either function as collection sites or sites for the preparation of the raw materials that were then introduced into the pyramids, which created chemical reactions and produced chemicals on a large scale. So this was the first site that we visited that really got my wheels turning in regard to the pyramids being connected to the science of chemistry. Another unexpected departure in our trip to Egypt was a journey inside the Red Pyramid of Dashur. And this was the second site we visited that really completely changed my mind in regard to the true purpose of the Egyptian pyramid and led me on the path of discovering the pyramid's connection to chemistry. And as soon as you travel down the northern shaft into the first chamber of the Red Pyramid, you're blasted with this overwhelming an intense smell of pure chemical ammonia. And there is chemical staining that covers the walls of these chambers. You can see here on the left, this is the third and final chamber, the synthesis chamber. Um, again, the, the dark nebulous staining in the upper portion of the vault here. And on the right, you can really see the pattern of the chemical staining in this first chamber. Now the specific pattern of this chemical staining is an indication of the flow dynamics that were involved in the structure's operation. So the pyramids were designed to harness the Nile River flooding and water was channeled from the Nile into the reservoir surrounding the structure and that water was utilized inside the chambers as a mechanism of the structure's operation and also in many cases as an initial reactant in the chemical reaction process. And the water was used to produce chemical reactions and then to move chemicals throughout the structure. So again, the staining on the walls within the Red Pyramid are indications of those flow dynamics that were created using the water and pressure inside the structure to again create chemical reactions and then move the chemicals throughout the chambers within the structure. So after my experience at Abu Sir and inside the Red Pyramid, this is what I was picturing inside my head. I was very familiar with the internal configuration of the Egyptian pyramids. And you see here on the left, the Step Pyramid, the Bent Pyramid, the Red Pyramid, and the Great Pyramid. And I began to conceive of this notion that the chambers inside these structures were actually large scale beakers or flasks. Again, we know that the Egyptians were masters of chemistry on a small scale, and they would have had the knowledge to engineer these structures and produce these chemical reactions on a large scale. So instead of looking at these chambers as just stone burial chambers, I began to think of them as vessels for chemical reactions. And if you evaluate the Egyptian pyramids, breaking down each component as a unit of a chemical manufacturing process, 
you can begin to truly understand these structures. So again, you have these beakers that produce the chemical reactions. You have these connecting tubes that leak, link your beakers and link your flasks together. You have these condenser columns and again, small scale laboratory apparatus. And you see those same components in the Egyptian pyramids. The chambers would have been your reaction vessels. You have shafts that connect the reaction vessels. You have shafts which were used to introduce the raw materials into the structure. And again, looking here in the bottom right corner on the left, the interior components of the Great Pyramid. My original thought was that the Grand Gallery here might have functioned like a condenser column. After a little bit of research, um, I changed the theory for that particular structure. But again, if you evaluate the components of the pyramids and compare them to units of a chemical manufacturing process, you can truly begin to understand um, the actual intention and the, the true purpose of these structures. So on the same day that we got to go inside the Red Pyramid, we also got to journey inside a structure called the Serapium. And inside the Serapium, you will find these large granite boxes, uh, which I believe were for collection and storage. And one of the theories and one of kind of the mysteries about this structure is how did they get these enormous boxes in into these small caverns? So the Serapium is kind of a tunnel structure. It has these underground tunnels which branch off into these small caverns. And inside these caverns are these massive granite. Um, There's several other materials used. and They're all different. Each one of the boxes is different, which is a bit unusual. But I began to think that the boxes were not brought into the structure, but rather the boxes were already there. And an artificial mound or hill was built on top of these boxes to bury and conceal them. And that the tunnels were excavated at a later date to then go in and extract what was contained or stored within these boxes. Um, again, I couldn't just, I couldn't wrap my head around the idea that they were trying to move these boxes into a structure, but rather that the, the caverns and tunnels were excavated later and the boxes were already in place. And the reason I mentioned that, so we get back to the hotel. Again, so I had this crazy experience at Abu Sir with the collection bowl and said, okay, what are, what are the pyramids producing that need to be collected? We journey inside the red pyramid and there's this intense smell of chemical ammonia. I was well aware of how valuable a chemical uh, like ammonia is to any great civilization. It is still to us today. And I'm envisioning the chambers of the pyramids being these chemical reaction vessels. We go into the Serapium and I'm conceiving of these granite boxes as collection or storage um, vessels and that the chambers and uh, tunnels around them were excavated at a later date to then go and extract what was stored within these granite boxes. After our experience in the Serapium, we returned to the hotel that evening and I will say this, so Egypt is a very strange and mysterious place. The entire experience there was unbelievably surreal. And so we go to Abu Sir. I conceive of the idea that the Egyptian pyramids were producing and collecting chemicals. We got to journey inside the Red Pyramid and I smell the intense smell of chemical ammonia, chemical staining on the walls of the chambers. And I'm starting to envision the chambers of these structures being industrial scale chemical apparatus. And journey inside the Serapium and I'm again thinking about these boxes as being a collection or storage containers that were buried inside this large mound. And we returned to the hotel this evening. And this is just one of the weirdest stories that has ever happened in my life. And so we get to the hotel lobby that evening. And for some reason, I had to go to the front desk. And while I'm at the front desk in the lobby of the hotel, I hear a very, very distinct Southern accent. So I was traveling there. I live in the Southeastern United States. And again, in the hotel lobby, I'm at the front desk. 
I hear this very, very recognizable Southern accent. So I turn around, there's a young guy there, pretty much my age, by himself with his tour guide. I said, hey man, did I, I recognize your accent, where are you from? And the universe works in mysterious ways. And again, this was a very surreal adventure. Um, and this was by far the craziest thing that happened while we were in Egypt. So of course this guy says that he is from the exact same city that I am from. And this coincidence did not go unnoticed. Let me put it that way. So I start talking to this guy. He said that his name was Trip, and that he worked for the TSA and he was on vacation, um, you know, on leave from TSA and he decided to go to Egypt. And by some mysterious coincidence, we just happened to be in the lobby of our hotel in Egypt at the same time, me and this guy from the exact same city that I am from. So again, very, very unusual. So I invite Trip to dinner with us that evening. Uh, Cause again, we just wanted to sit and talk about our experience in Egypt. And again, I'm sort of mulling over this, again, brand new theory in my head that the Egyptian pyramids were producing chemicals. So we all sit down at dinner and again, this is just a shot from uh, my hotel room in Egypt. And you could kind of get the idea of, you know, so the sun is setting in the background and we're sitting here by the pool and there's all these Egyptians smoking hookah and we're sitting out there having dinner, talking to this guy. And I was sharing with him my ideas about the Egyptian pyramids. I kind of explained some of the theories regarding the Great Pyramid, uh, these alternative theories about its true purpose. And he was kind of nodding his head. And he was familiar with some of them. And then I began to dive in to my new theory that the Egyptian pyramids were designed to produce chemicals. And again, I was showing him that same picture of the, the laboratory chemical apparatus um, and in comparing it to the inner components of the structures. And he was just looking at me nodding like, of course that's what they were for. Just so matter of factly, it was, uh, <laughs> I gotta get chills just talking about the story. So I had told Bethany about this idea. And again, this had just came into my head and we're talking to this guy, <laughs> just happens to be from the exact same place that I'm from that we run into in a hotel lobby in Egypt sitting here having dinner and I'm telling him about this crazy ass new theory. And he's like, of course, that's what they're for. Just so matter of fact, so, so certain. Um, again, I think it was a universal indication that I was on the right track. And again, just a very surreal experience. So we're again, Bethany are kind of looking back and forth at each other. Like what the fuck is going on here? How does this guy know about this already? <laughs> Cause again, he wasn't surprised at all. And man, it was just the weirdest thing. So again, we start talking about the Serapium and these granite boxes and I'm telling him that I thought the boxes were actually buried and, and you know, hidden within this mound and that the, the tunnels were extracted at a later date to then go in and remove what was stored from these, these containers. And um, he was like, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, that, that's what makes sense. And he was asking me what I thought was stored in them. And I said, well, I don't, I don't really know at this point. And he looked at me again, very matter of fact, when he said waste material. And again, Bethany and I are kind of looking back and forth at each other. <laughs> it was, uh, again, a very, very surreal experience. And so during this journey that led me to writing this book, I've had a series of events that have just, again, been universal indications that I'm on the right track and that the theory that I had come up with. Um, was worth pursuing, worth investigating, and worth sharing with everyone. Um, it, was, it was absolutely crazy. Again, I still kind of get chill bumps. Uh, Trip, if you're out there, uh, <laughs> again, thank you for joining us. It was absolutely crazy. All right, so a little background on the time frame that I use in the book. I do not believe that the Egyptian pyramids were built by the dynastic Egyptians, but that they predated that civilization. And there's some very good research going on right now in regard to the end of the last ice age, circa 10,000 BC, and the ancient civilizations that existed in North and South America. And part of the narrative of the book is that there was an ancient civilization in the Americas that had knowledge of chemistry. 
and there was a large scale catastrophe, we got around 10,000 BC. They say that a comet hit this ice sheet that covered the, the northern part of North America, which created a massive global flood. And I do believe that to be the flooding um, that is referred to in the Bible and all of these other ancient myths. So the refugees that fled this ancient civilization would have crossed the Atlantic and brought their knowledge of chemistry into Europe and Africa. And again, the time frame of the book is 7,000 BC. So again, if in 10,000 BC, there was this massive catastrophe. The refugees flee into Europe and into Africa. They gradually migrate to the interior of the country. And several thousand years later, they are building these pyramid structures in Egypt. And again, the time frame I use is 7,000 BC. Again, the pyramids of Egypt were designed to operate in conjunction with the Nile River flooding, and they would have needed plentiful rainfall for their operation. And as I began to investigate the history of the Sahara, I learned that from the time frame between 8,500 BC and 5,300 BC, there were actually monsoon rains that were transforming the Saharan desert into a vast and fertile agricultural area. Um, so there are several components that would have been required for the operation of the Egyptian pyramids. Again, plentiful rainfall, large-scale agriculture, and also large-scale domestication of cattle, which is during this time frame. Um, the archaeological and historical records do indicate that there was, again, massive scale domestication of cattle, uh, large scale agriculture, and significantly more rainfall and volume of water in the area. All three components which are essential to the operation of the Egyptian pyramids. And again, I don't believe that the dynastic Egyptians built these structures. They came several thousand years before and were repurposed uh, around the year 3500 BC when the dynastic Egyptians moved back into the area. And again, the domestication of the cattle and the large scale agriculture are both essential to the operation of the Step Pyramid. The Step Pyramid being the first structure in the sequence of chemical manufacturing plants that were constructed in Egypt. So I didn't know this until we got to travel to the Giza Plateau and investigate the three pyramids of Giza, that these structures were actually color coded. And the color of these structures has a direct correlation to the alchemical slash chemical reaction process. So the Great Pyramid of Giza was cased in limestone, white limestone. The Middle Pyramid was cased in red granite. And the third and smallest pyramid was cased in black salt. And this is just a quote from the chapter, The Fourth Degree of the Land of Chem, when Aquari and Brother Julius travel to Giza so Aquari can receive the final degrees of the Egyptian pyramids. And these degrees are all conferred at night. And he and Brother Julius travel to this survey platform which overlooks the Giza Plateau. So the three Giza pyramids, one cased in iridescent white limestone, one in blood red granite with a white limestone peak, and one in coal black basalt stood before them in the distance, glowing radiantly in the moonlight, their reservoirs perfectly reflecting the stars above. They were alive. And at this point in the story, Aquari already knows that these structures indeed were alive inside with chemical reactions. And he's overlooking the plateau and becomes overwhelmed by the beauty of these structures and the, the knowledge of what was occurring inside them. So I just wanted to share that quote. It's one of my favorites from the book and uh, just kind of a beautiful picture of how these structures would have actually looked uh, in their heyday. Okay, so in this image, you can see the connection between the color coding of the three Giza pyramids and the three colors used to depict the chemical reaction stages of the alchemists. And you can see here on the left, this is a depiction of the Negredo stage of the alchemical process. And again, we know that the word alchemy, meaning from the blackness, referred to this chemical reaction 
where solvents were used to extract the volatile compounds from your burned or putrefied raw materials. So again, you are extracting chemicals from the blackness, the word alchemy, which led to our modern word for chemistry. So again, black negredo stage, you have the white albedo stage, and you have the red rubedo stage. So when I returned from Egypt, I began to research the connection between chemistry and the Egyptian pyramids. And I began to discover all of these connections between depictions used in alchemy, um, our modern industrial processes for producing chemicals, and the Egyptian pyramids. And again, these series of connections became um, extremely evident and again were indications that I was on the right track and that there was merit to this theory. Um, so as I began to kind of pull at the string a little bit, uh, the mystery just began to unravel. And again, I kept stumbling across one thing after another after another that again really encouraged me um, to continue evaluating this, this theory. And again, which, which led me here to writing this book. So again, in these alchemical drawings, um, you see here these chambers as a recurring theory in these alchemical pictures. And these were drawn before the modern industrial revolution. So there wouldn't have been industrial scale chemical production. So what knowledge did these alchemists have or these uh, proto chemists have that they were trying to depict here? And I do believe that the science of chemistry has remained intact since the pre-dynastic Egyptian pyramid. Um, but at points during our history, it was hidden uh, due to the persecution of science during certain periods. So again, they were, they, the knowledge was never lost and they were depicting it here in these diagrams. But again, they are showing that there are chemical reactions occurring inside chambers, which again was a direct connection to my theory about the Egyptian pyramids and the chambers inside those structures being utilized to produce chemical reactions. So again, just indications that I was on the right track. And I kept seeing these recurring themes. Again, here on the right, you see, and all of this is a depiction of a chemical reaction process. Um, it may not appear to be that way uh, to someone uninitiated in reading these diagrams, but they were all depicting chemistry. But again, or, okay, so in this next one, again, I kept seeing these chambers as a recurring theme in all of these diagrams. And again, it was a direct connection to my theory that the chambers inside the pyramids were designed to produce chemical reactions. And all of these drawings are actually depicting a chemical reaction process. Um, to the uninitiated, it could be very difficult to interpret this. Um, but again, they had just hidden the science of chemistry under this veil of spiritual allegory um, during times when science was very much persecuted. So the alchemists couldn't practice chemistry in the open. They very much had to hide what they were doing. And again, they encoded their knowledge of chemistry into these very enigmatic diagrams. But I kept seeing, again, these connections between um, chemistry incurring in these chambers, which again, was directly related to the theory that uh, the chambers inside the Egyptian pyramids were designed to produce chemical reactions. In this slide, um, again, I began to stumble across these depictions of these mound structures, and this will apply directly to the chapter, the sixth degree in the land of Chem, and to the ancient passage chamber mounds of Ireland. And you can see here on the left that the alchemy occurring underground, again, this kind of Kundalini reminiscent spiral here in the middle, is actually depicting a chemical reaction process. And the chemical reaction process emanates from these mounds. Again, this is a direct connection to the passage chamber mounds of Ireland, which I also believe were designed to produce chemicals. And you can see here on the right, again, I kept finding these structures with chemical reactions occurring inside them. 
again, a direct indication that I was kind of on the right track. And you see this kind of step pyramid structure here. And again, the calcination, sublimation, solution, putrefaction, distillation, coagulation, and tincture. Again, these chemical reactions incurring, uh, occurring inside the structure. One. So my experience inside the Red Pyramid of Dashur completely changed my understanding of the Egyptian pyramids. And it is because of the detailed schematics that are available of this structure that I was able to decipher their mechanism of operation. So again, inside this structure, I saw the dark nebulous staining in the top portion of the chamber. And I began to apply my knowledge of physics to the configuration of these chambers. And you can see here that in the upper vault of these chambers, there is significantly reduced volume compared to the total volume of the chamber. So the chambers inside the Red Pyramid were designed to manipulate the temperature and pressure of water insoluble gases by changing their volume to produce chemical reactions. I won't go into the specific details as that's contained in the book, but I knew that they were again manipulating temperature and pressure by reducing the volume of the water insoluble gases to produce a chemical reaction. Again, so you're reducing volume and increasing temperature and pressure. And I knew that the Red Pyramid smelled like ammonia and there's all this chemical staining and the smell intensifies as you get to the third and final synthesis chamber. So I began to research the possibility that the red pyramid was producing ammonia. So I began to look into the modern industrial process for ammonia production. And let's evaluate this diagram quickly. So inside the red pyramid, you have three chambers. First chamber, your second chamber, which are at ground level inside the structure. And you have an elevated third and final synthesis chamber. So as I began to research the modern process for industrial production of ammonia, again, I found an immediate so I began to research the modern production of ammonia on an industrial scale. And I found this picture of the original apparatus that was designed to produce ammonia. And I was quite surprised to find an immediate connection between the configuration of this apparatus and the configuration of the Red Pyramid. The Red Pyramid had three chambers, two at ground level and the elevated final synthesis chamber. And that is exactly what you see here in this apparatus that was designed to produce ammonia. So the red pyramid was producing chemical reactions by manipulating the temperature and pressure of gases. And that is exactly the function of this apparatus. Again, I believe that there was a very intentional design in regard to the configuration of this apparatus, which I think paid homage to the place from whence it came. Um, I won't go into further detail on that. So in this next picture of the original apparatus designed to produce ammonia, again, you can really see the similarity between the configuration of this apparatus and the configuration of the Red Pyramid. So just envision, a 45-45-90 triangle surrounding this chemical apparatus and compare that to the configuration of the red pyramid and there is a direct connection between these two designs. So here on the right you can see the northern shaft leading into the first chamber of the red pyramid. Here on the left you can see this tube leading into the first chamber of this apparatus. These two chambers at a level, and these two chambers here at ground level inside the Red Pyramid. 
There is a shaft that connects the first and second chamber in the red pyramid. There is a tube system that connects the first and second chamber of this chemical apparatus. And inside the red pyramid, you have the elevated third and final synthesis chamber. And that is exactly what you see here in this chemical apparatus. So the chambers inside the red pyramid were engineered to produce chemical reactions by manipulating the temperature and pressure of water and soluble gases. As those gases were compressed into the upper vault of these chambers, their volume was reduced, increasing their temperature and pressure to again produce a chemical reaction. That is very similar to the way that this chemical apparatus operated. Again, increasing the temperature and pressure inside these metal chambers to produce a chemical reaction that eventually synthesized ammonia. And that is why I refer to the third and final chamber of the red pyramid as the synthesis chamber. And in the chapter, the second degree of the land of chem, I give a detailed explanation for how this structure functioned. Um, every mechanism, every chemical reaction, um, again, is thoroughly explained as a query receives the second degree and is given the true purpose of the Red Pyramid. Okay, so in this picture, uh, again, this is a photo of Bethany and I inside the first chamber of the Red Pyramid. You can see here that the staining in the upper portion of the chamber starts precisely at the third tier. And again, the reduced volume in the upper vault section is what created the chemical reaction. So the chamber was filled with gases. The chamber was then filled with water. The water compressed the gases into the upper portion of the chamber, reducing their volume, increasing their temperature and pressure, and facilitating a chemical reaction process. Here again, you can see the second chamber of the red pyramid, this dark staining in the upper portion of the chamber. And again, it starts precisely at the third tier. And I give a uh, thorough explanation of why that is the case in the second degree of the land of Kevin. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to part two of this ongoing video series here on my YouTube channel. Um, I just wanted to give some background in regard to the research that went into developing these theories. Um, there's lots more to come in the, the subsequent videos. So for those of you that are interested, if you want to buy a copy of the book, it is available for digital download at www.thelandofchem.com. If you're interested, grab a t-shirt and wear the greatest secret of all time. <laughs> Again, the logo depicting the red pyramid and the chemical reaction that produces ammonia inside it. I'm very happy with how these t-shirts turned out and I absolutely love them. So I'll also be having paperback copies of the book that are available later this year and I will make a formal announcement on my social media, which is on Instagram, at the land of chem, if you'd like to follow me and uh, keep up with my regular posts on there. And if you would, please subscribe to the land of chem YouTube channel. If you like this video, definitely give me a like. If you didn't, <laughs> that's cool too. <laughs> I'm still gonna keep making them. And um, leave a comment. Uh, I absolutely love the interaction from everybody. I love to read and respond to the comments. If you have any questions or anything that you would like for me to cover in future videos, there's gonna be a lot more of these coming. So again, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I really, really appreciate all of your support and I'll see you on the next one.